Adam was roused from his nightmare dotted slumber by a fist pounding three times, loudly, on the door of Farilla's room. He rapidly jerked to a half sitting position, supported by his elbows as it opened, and Slip poked her head in through the doorway. Very get up. Adam's gone miss, she said, pausing as her gaze turned to the bandaged and shirtless Adam in Ferry's bed. Briefly, her eyes narrowed before her face blanked and continued. Oh, you're here. Great. That solves one problem. The Major wants to see you in her office. Time now, Slip said, turning on her heels and quickly fleeing the room. Adam lay back down next to Ferry briefly. At some point in the night, she had turned away from him, the spoons now reversed. She stirred silently at Slip's sudden and loud entry, but had quickly returned to a warm spot on the bed. As Adam held her from behind, he planted a gentle kiss on her neck, inadvertently getting a mouthful of hair in the process. You should go see the Major, she mumbled groggily, unconsciously grunting her hips into Adam as he pulled her close. If she says time now, she means you should be sprinting down there, she laughed, as he planted another kiss on her neck and said, Go, I'm not going anywhere. With that, she rolled to face him and gently pushed on him with her arm. Adam relented from his assault, finally climbing out of the bed. He threw his shirt on and headed to the door. He turned to Ferry at the door. Last night was nice, Ferry. He smiled warmly. Thanks for letting me take things slow. She returned a dazzling smile as he left her door, moving down the hallway. He hoped to run into Slip to ask what had her worked up both last night and this morning, but she had clearly made herself scarce. He meandered around the winding building for a while, trying desperately to remember where the Major's office was. After no less than 15 minutes of searching, he finally found it on the ground floor in a hallway labelled Command Staff. Knocking twice before opening the door, he found Grim with her arms crossed atop her chest, glaring half-heartedly. Took you long enough? You gonna fucking foul land nav on me? She said with a sly smile. Adam straightened to her attention at the light-hearted chastisement from his superior officer. Not intentionally, he said with a grin. You wanted to see me, Major? That I did. I've headed some rush orders with the supply chain after our chain debacle. Speaking of which, it's Captain, now. Even though it wasn't our fault, Command still had to say they fucked someone for it. Could have been worse, though. Rising to her feet, she sighed and continued. But back on the topic of you, I think you're going to like what I have. She then opened the box on the right-hand side of her desk and tossed him a uniform top. He caught it out of the air and began to inspect it. It was the same make as the rest of the team, covered in the urban tone digital and paintbrush combination that he had been ogling on the entire trip out to Fayara. The tab on the left side of his chest contained what he believed was his name, written in the Shorbanti runic script. The emblem festooned to the right sleeve, just below the shoulder, caught his attention significantly more. It was a relatively simple palm-sized white logo on a black background. It depicted a spear pointed down at an unfamiliar animal skull. Beneath the logo sat a single rocker. Like it? She asked before continuing. A former member of the team came up with it after a knob went sideways in a Rakiri world. Carter ended up dropping her rifle and grabbed a discarded spear before ramming it through the Guntra's mouth. Hence the spear and skull. To the women at selection, however, it will let them know that you've been directly recruited by a pod. Directly recruited, Captain? Asked Adam, using her new title. Oh, that's right. I haven't told you about how we actually function yet, have I? No, ma'am. He replied, frankly eager to learn the inner workings of a completely different race's special operations branch. Deathheads recruit one of two ways. The first option, and much more common, is for a bitch to serve at least three years in the regular military. That can be either the Marines, Interior, or even the Militia. Adam raised his brow at the presence of the Chauvanti Militia. To him, having a bunch of civilian fighters with no real training seemed outside the realm of Chauvanti norm, but he chalked it up to things being wild on the periphery. She continued, seemingly unperturbed by his gaze. After this, they can re-enlist and put in a packet with their chain of command to maybe, just maybe, get accepted into DHIAP. And the other, ma'am? He asked, when she clearly looked for a response. It's called direct recruitment. If you do something to impress a pod commander, and they have a slot available in their team, they can directly pull you into rotation. Usually this is done for fellow military members that have relevant skill sets, but there is an allowance for a commander to pull directly from the civilian population. She flashed him a prideful grin before continuing. Direct recruits tend to hold a higher status amongst the selection cadre and the other recruits, especially if they've been blooded. That rocker under your insignia, it means you're blooded. Or to throw these cards for a loop when they see it too. He moved and placed the uniform in his box, doing his best to fold it properly. Might I ask was in the other box? He asked, his curiosity boiling over his self-control. Oh, that's the real fucking treat of the day, 
she said, manners briefly flashing in her eyes. You see, Adam, pretty much all death heads have cybernetic augments in their own suits. The kind varies from person to person, based on skill sets, available funds and mission goals. Some, like Popper, have unusual vision modifications, allowing them to see in situations or objects that others couldn't. She looked up at the ceiling before continuing. Others, like myself and Slip, have augmentations that enhance our speed, endurance or physical abilities. Unfortunately, they're also prohibitively expensive to incorporate, so most commanders only have one or two. Some of the Nobleborn teens can have as many as seven within their suits, though. She stepped aside from the box, gesturing for Adam to approach and investigate. Adam, she said, her tone turning decidedly sombre and serious. I hope you realise the amount of favours I had to burn to get you this. Don't fuck me, okay? Not gonna happen, ma'am, said Adam, removing the top of the box only to stop dead in his tracks. Atop the suit that lay within sat a Death's Head Commando helmet, their various optical enhancements poking forth from where they sat atop the eyes. What called Adam of Guard, though, was a familiar but different logo painted across the face of the helmet. During a now distant feeling time of his life, he had painted a red skull across his gas mask. Long, jagged fangs protruded down from the drawn cheekbones, meeting an equally menacing set of fangs in the jawline. His artistic skill was negligible, but the crude drawing had gotten the job done. Emblazed on this helmet, however, was a significantly better drawn, yet clearly inspired by his own design, Deep Blue Skull. The significant difference between the two designs other than the colour was the way two canine fangs jutted out at an angle, clearly meant to represent a dramatised version of the tusks that were a hallmark of the Shorvanti as a species. Adam was briefly taken aback by the display, complicated feelings of joy and pride at the artwork, contrasting with what he had done or during the previous iteration. You can thank Slip for the decal. Once she and Ferry rifle for your things and sold the gas mask, she practically locked me in this office and demanded I let her work on the helmet before I gave it to you. Smiling like she was thinking of some unknown to Adam joke in her head, she continued. She can be quite the little artist when she gets her heart set on something, you know? Nodding. He made a mental note to thank Slip for the gesture later. Setting the helmet to the side, he withdrew the suit, its matte black material feeling cool to the touch. He noticed the half-inch embossing that ran along the hips, legs and spine of the armour, along with small silvery circles that periodically existed across the chest, back and limbs of the suit. I'm gonna step out real quick so you can change. I'll explain the functionality to your kit after you're done, said the now captain, walking towards the door. Adam took off his basketball shorts, now clad in the tight spandex underwear and his tank top. He slipped into the suit, which fit snugly against his skin, but not uncomfortably. He looked down at himself, zipping up the front. It hugged the muscles of his chest and arms, stretching slightly as he flexed. Satisfied with himself, he called out the door. All good in here, Captain. Captain Grimm stepped through the doorway, clicking her tongue with a prideful smile. Death's head looks damn good on you, Adam. Damn good. Thank you. I'm not going to lie, it feels good to be part of a team again. And that you are. Now let's talk about the gadgets I worked so hard to get my dirty fucking hands on. She sauntered over to him, picking up his left hand and flicking open a small panel. The panel had eight small buttons inside, with a small blue bar sat atop them. The bar above is your suit's battery level. When exposed to solar or thermal radiation, your suit will automatically recharge itself. Depending on exposure, ten minutes of sunbathing will net you a full battery, usually, give or take. Moving to the button, she continued. The four buttons in the centre are all basic vision types for a death's head, and are relatively standard, she said, gesturing at the small surface in order. You have night vision, thermal, combination, and a zoom function that can increase to about ten times normal. She moved her rubber hand to the embossed lines on the sides of his legs, and the centre of his back. Now, this is going to feel really weird the first time you turn it on, so just bear with me, and try not to jump, okay? Adam nodded, and she pressed the first button. He felt the embossment shift and harden to what felt like steel around his legs, shifting them slightly. After he took a couple of pensive steps around the room, it felt almost like his legs were moving of their own volition, with little input from Adam's own muscles. Returning to the officer, he quirked a brow, waiting for it to continue. That button activates the synth fiber reinforcements in your legs, allowing you to run significantly further and faster than you normally would. She smiled before tapping the button again, the fiber on his legs returning from its still like consistency. This button, she continued, finger hovering above the circle. You're just going to have to take my word on for now, as there's no way I'm letting you activate a jump kit indoors. It just repurposes the existing system for increased speed, and uses it to give you a 10 meter vertical. In addition, 
the captain said, not waiting for Adam to get a word in edgewise. It will allow you to safely fall from a height less than 20 metres without serious negative side effects. Still hurts like a bitch though, trust me. Adam exhaled. Taking a moment to process that woman in front of him was essentially imbuing him with superpowers. He supposed, though, that any technology sufficiently advanced enough would appear as magic to the unacquainted. There's two bunch you haven't covered yet, ma'am. Can I ask what they do? For those, you can thank our pod armorer, Corilla. Apparently she was tits deep in one of your pre-war TV shows before you showed up, and you wearing your heavy armor gave her an idea. She paused as she walked over to the box, removing a small cloth divider that had separated the suit from something else. She then poured a vaguely pentagon-shaped plate of metal from the box. As different as its jelly-rolled Damascus iridescent purple surface was, he clearly recognised it as a body armour plate, shaped similarly to a swimmer's cut. She walked over to him, pushed the top rightmost button on his wrist, and pressed it to his chest with a click. Returning to the box, she retrieved and affixed in short order a backplate, shin and thigh plates, deltoid protectors, and two gauntlets, with the left one having a cutout, so he could access a small panel on his wrist. The armor is heavier than you're used to. If I recall correctly, about six pounds heavier than your old plate carrier and helmet, along with the several pound weight of your suit itself. Smiling, she continued. The trade-off being that it's made from some experimental composite locked behind several layers of classification that even I'm not allowed to see. How she got a hold of enough to make this, I have no idea. Making small chicken wings with his arms and bouncing slightly, Adam sussed out the armor. It felt right in his body, somewhere between what he was used to and that of a medieval knight. What does it do exactly? Besides the obvious, I mean, he asked, quirking a brow. The truth is that the flexible fiber our uniforms are made from can only stop so much before losing structural integrity. That, combined with a weakness for low speed, high mass attacks, leads to a glaring weakness within our suits that has been exploited by Alliance commanders in the past, she grimaced, clearly remembering a very bad day in some faraway place. I have been assured that this material, on the other hand, will be able to stop anything short of a direct facing hit from a LAS cannon. Pretty much ad infinitum, too, as it covers most of your vital areas. It might come in handy someday. I gotta say, ma'am, said Adam, not quite interrupting her. I feel pretty fucking cool right now. Oh, but I saved the best for last, she said, grinning like a madwoman while pointing at the last circle. This button activates an electrostatic charge when rowing your plates. When turned on, anyone or anything that touches your armor will receive a 600 amp shock to the core, lethal to any known species in the galaxy. Adam's eyes nearly bulged out of his skull. On a whim, he could practically turn his entire body into a super taser. He was willing to wonder how it would work against machines when Grimm continued. The downside being that, well, it's kind of a blow and go feature. One good release of energy and your entire battery is drained. It's really only for use in emergencies. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Good. Now grab your helmet and go with Popper, the captain bade, gesturing to the large woman that stood in the doorway behind Adam, unbeknownst to him until now. She's going to supervise an instructor on how to use your suit at Site 7 for the rest of the day. I'll have Ferry or Slip take your uniforms up to your dorm. He straightened, snapping to attention, and delivering a Shavanti salute to his commander. This elicited a chuckle from both the senior members of the team before he turned and followed Popper out. Shit, killer, you clean up nice, said the team's non-commissioned officer, dressed in her own suit. Well, take my car. I don't have legs like you do. Fair enough. What's Site 7, by the way? Site 7 is just a training area. Got some trees, a small mock-up town, and a few burned-out vehicles to assist with training units. And we've got it to ourselves for the rest of the day, she said, grinning at Adam as they left the building that was now his home. Looking down at the helmet in his hands as he followed her, he noticed something that had passed him by earlier. A small slip knot ran under the jawline of the helmet, clearly functioning as Slip's artistic signature. Huh, he thought, as they made it to the Shavanti equivalent of a pickup truck. I hope she's okay, 